Welcome back, everyone. I hope you had a refreshing lunch break and now you're ready and energized for the rest of the event. We have an exciting panel coming up next uh, as we're going to dive into our next session focusing on the role of policymakers in driving the green transition here in the UK. So, um, without further ado, I'm going to invite our um, distinguished panelists and panel of experts to join us here. We've got Georgia Gold, the leader of um, Camden Council, Shirley Rodriguez, Deputy Mayor of London, Robbie McPherson, Senior Political Advisor at Uplift and Climate APPG Lead, Annabel Rice, Political Advisor at Green Alliance, Ton Langinian, Senior Policy Advisor for Climate and Energy Policy at the Tony Blair Institute. A very warm welcome to all of you and thank you so much for being with us today. We really appreciate that you've uh, made time to be with us here today. So I'm going to just uh, kick off by uh, asking you the questions as I would like to go through all the questions that I've got here for you. Uh, Shirley, if I may, mm -hmm. I would like to start off by asking you, in your experience overseeing global climate change grants, what strategies have you found most effective in driving sustainable initiatives at the city level? Well, thank you for inviting me here. And, and that sort of partly refers to some of the work I did in my, in my career working for a a philanthropy, um, but also worked at various local authorities where we were doing grant giving. And I think the biggest thing is, is being really clear about the direction and the ambition. So um, getting leaders like Georgia or the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, being really clear about where we need to be um, and what the target is. So in London, it's a, a net zero uh, London by 2030. Really ambitious, very tough, but it sets that, you know, the marching orders essentially for all of us, not, not just the mayor, not just the boroughs, but individuals, businesses and so on. Uh, and then looking, you know, having set that strategy, then it's a whole host of things about, you know, understanding uh, where the issues are, you know, whether it's where your emissions are or where the problems are, and then really um, diving in to understand where you can make the most impact um, uh, and where you might start. And of course, that varies from city to city, uh, local authority to local authority. You know, we have different powers, different circumstances, different makeups. So you have to have a, a sort of broad strategy, but then fine tune it. Um, and then I think absolutely in parallel with all of, you know, for all of this is really um, engaging the communities. You know, this can't be a top down, deliver it to people. It has to be with uh, local people saying, what do they want? And then um, how do you um, help deliver that? Um, and we're doing some of that. We could probably talk about that a little bit later about some of the examples that we're, we're doing in London. And then finally, a big, big part of that is communication. It's messaging and um, really getting the messaging out about why we need to do it, what, what help is available, um, you know, what the benefits are. Um, and then, you know, just to flag as well, you know, we've had a lot, and you've probably seen some of this, I think, with some of the policies here, but, you know, globally, a lot of distrust and mistrust, disinformation and misinformation. So that's a sort of huge change over the last few years, and we're having to fight against that. So that's sort of engaging with a whole range of stakeholders to really push this forward is absolutely key. Um, when we talk about the policy making process, it's all about implementation and basically the practicality. Mm. Uh, Tone, in your work um, at the Tony Blair Institute, how do you translate net zero policy goals into practical and actionable strategies for policy makers? Yeah, so. At the Tony Blair Institute, um, what we do is that we work with leaders, so both in the UK but also across the world. Um, and I think what's really interesting when it comes to kind of net zero goals is that, you know, when you're a political leader, you have a number of different priorities on your on your list of things to do, and, and net zero and reducing emissions is only one of them. So what we often try to do is think about how you can um, link up those different ambitions with each other 
to, to kind of create synergies and create kind of incentives for acting on climate policy, uh, which I think is a really important first step. And I think a good example of this is we do a lot of work with leaders in Africa, for instance, where um, development will be their top priority, uh, <coughs> rightly. Um, so it's, it's understanding, um, you know, how you can then practically talk about um, renewables, for instance, as a means to um, further development. And um, in, in an African context, for instance, there are a huge amount of barriers to do that. So then you need to think very practically through, so what does that mean? How do you then get the investment into a solar project, for instance? How do you set up your energy market to enable that rather than enabling fossil fuels? And um, so it's, it's kind of working through both the kind of high level ambitions and then working through what that means practically and explain that clearly. And I, I think um, kind of thinking about that those high-level uh, aims together is, is a really important kind of a first step to get to those practical solutions. Absolutely, and at the same time, um, the cross-party collaboration, another important part of um, the policy-making process. And um, uh, Robbie, as a senior political advisor, what strategies do you employ to foster cross-party collaboration and consensus on climate-related issues in Westminster? Yeah, there's a really um, important few points here which um, I would just like to highlight to begin with, which is that the UK's political consensus on climate is definitely, um, in some ways, quite unique to this country. Um, it is, unfortunately, um, in recent years, under quite intense attack, um, and it is beginning um, to, to, to weaken, quite frankly. And thirdly, um, on a more positive side, I think there are many things um, that we can do um, to mend it. But if we just take a step back um, and look what um, the UK's political consensus has allowed us to achieve, um, it has allowed us to achieve huge legislative frameworks um, which have really been able to drive forward policy um, over the past um, decade or so, including the 2008 Climate Change Act, which was voted through um, under um, Ed Miliband and um, the Labour Party, which was um, really world-leading um, legislation, but made stronger by um, the Lib Dems and, yes, the Conservatives um, in opposition um, relating to the role of the CCC on the UK's emission reduction targets. Again, in 2019, net zero 2050, a huge consensual um, piece of legislation. And in 2019, um, at the general election, to top it off, 95% of voters told politicians um, by electing parties committed to 2050 net zero or sooner that this is something that matters to them. So I think that the consensus is strong in Westminster and across the country. But unfortunately, what we've seen is a weaponization of climate policies um, not least um, under this particular government, um, which is unfortunate, and that is really coming to a head in terms of um, my job in Westminster to bring people together around ambition um, on climate and nature. Um, and I think that that is something that we need to combat. I think that the way you do that is you challenge the skeptics head on. Um, you don't let them you know, run wild with this, quite frankly, mm -hmm. uh, disinformation and allow mistrust to become something that's sown. You provide an alternative vision, you paint what the future looks like, and you come up with deliverables to show how that policy can then be implemented. Um, and you meet people where they're at, because I think that in terms of politicians, I mean, Dr. May, you'll be able to speak on this and um, Councillor Board um, much more than I, but um, a, huge, a huge part of this is selling that back to the public and getting their buy-in. And unless voters um, want to see these policies um, then politicians are stuck, you know, outside the Hillerton window, struggling to get, get the policies forward. So I think them three things um, are really important. But in my job, um, leading the all-party group um, on climate at Uplift, and previously working with Annabelle Works at Green Alliance, leading the all-party environment group, I think that, um, you know, rallying MPs together through roundtables, providing them access to high-profile speakers, getting them out of Westminster for a start and showing them <laughs> that actually the, the race to renewables um, is happening in Grimsby, um, it's happening in the North Sea, um, homes are being insulated, um, and on the flip side, um, you know, people are thirsty for this, um, for this change, and bringing all of them things together, I think, um, is the types of strategies um, that, that I would suggest, but yeah. Consensus is really important. And I think Consensus, we need more of that. Uh, yes. Mm. So, translating the net zero goals into um, policies and then the collaboration, the cross party collaboration and consensus. Um, we earlier had a panel of uh, business. Um, 
COP28 outcomes and we had the founder of C40, we did talk about the importance of, of course, policies and regulations. So on that, Annabelle, in your experience with C40 cities, what lessons have you learned about the effective governance and mechanisms for accelerating urban climate action? Yeah, firstly, I just want to say thanks so much for organising this panel and the, the role of policymakers is so crucial and I think, yeah, really important to highlight. And building on the consensus that's already building around here, um, I think that firstly, I just wanted to say why cities are important in this debate. And I know I don't need to, to say this to many on the panel, but um, given that cities are responsible for some, something like, uh, that they're responsible for a large amount of emissions, but they also house around two thirds of the global population. They're gonna be hotbeds for innovation, for solutions, and really they're where the rubber meets the road in terms of action on the ground. Um, so as both you know, victims, but also contributors to climate action, they're really uniquely placed to handle um, the crisis that we're facing. And then I wanted to discuss why governance is important, because I think many in this room, if you think of a climate solution, the first thing that comes to mind might not be governance, but really how a city or any government at any level is run is completely crucial to actually achieving the action that we need to see and also the implementation that we've already discussed. Um, in terms of my experience at C40, I was managing our climate budgeting work, which London is pioneering, and I'm a huge fan of it. It's completely the gold standard for, for governance. But there are three really key things that I came across as, as key points for, for good governance. The first being the need for a real champion of a leader and one who's able to paint that positive vision that, that Robbie was talking about earlier. I think part of the reason that we've got into the situation where climate change is becoming increasingly polarised in, in you know, the populism that's building up inside and outside of the climate space, um, the way to combat that is really showing that acting on climate change isn't the benefit of all of us. And it, there's, there's a vision for a future that needs to be painted. And, and it's, it's difficult to find leaders that are, are able to do that successfully at the moment just because of the backlash that you can face from both the media but also um, certain areas of the public. So having that champion is so important. But it's even more important that that vision isn't just held with the leader. So whether it's a prime minister, whether it's a mayor, whoever it is, um, that, that uh, vision for the future needs to be shared by every single member of staff and that ranges from the interns to the managers to the senior managers. Everyone needs to know why the work that they're doing contributes to that overall objective. The second really crucial thing is the kind of horizontal mainstreaming of climate action. Climate change doesn't exist in a single department. It's, it, it's so fragmented, it sits across every single area of our society, so ranging from education to transport to everything. But our governance currently isn't built to work that way. There's so many silos in government, and that's true at a city level, but it's also true at um, a national level, and there's many that are working really hard to, to fight this, but it's a continued battle and it's, uh, the need for collaboration is, is really strong. Um, and then there's that piece on vertical integration too, so thinking about how cities are able to interact with national governments and be able to really advocate and ask for the powers that they need to act on climate change, but also bringing in the public. I think we've seen so many examples of failed policies where the idea is good, but there's been no engagement with stakeholders and that's why it fails. I think a really good example of that is the Green Home Scheme a few years ago at the national level, which failed because it was, tried to, it was put together in you know, a matter of mere weeks or months and industry just wasn't prepared to, to deal with it. Um, and if, if they had had that level of engagement, I think we, we could have seen a really different outcome. So yeah, those, those would be the three really key points. Thank you. Uh, we are at a stage in the human history that I think we need um, urgent action at every level of society. And that uh, brings me to you, Councillor Georgia. As a local councillor and leader of Camden Council, um, tell us what initiatives um, have you spearheaded to tackle the climate crisis at the community level? I think to your point, I think there's a lot of hope um, and an action happening at, at the local level. And we're not waiting for, for national government to act. We are, we are taking action alongside our communities. And I think that sits in a, in a number of different places. Like fundamentally, we need to, to as councils, kind of lead uh, ourselves uh, in relation to the powers we have. Um, so that's planning. Uh, it's our own estates in Camden. We've reduced uh, carbon in our estates by 63%. It's our transport leadership. We've um, trebled the amount of segregated cycle uh, spaces in the borough. It's um, 
it's uh, the, the work we're doing to decarbonise uh, homes. So there's, there's a whole kind of host of, of policies uh, we can take. Uh, and, uh, and climate has to be embedded in every decision, and we've changed our constitution to, to mean that every single decision the council takes, we have to consider the, the climate and uh, ecological emergency. And then we have a really important role as leader of place and convener, so working with all the different partners in our place, businesses, uh, communities, uh, public sector, to make sure that they are working together to, to achieve our, our 2030 ambitions. And, and realising that we can't act alone, we've been creating new coalitions across the country. So I chair something called London Councils, which is all of the London boroughs working really closely with, with Shirley and the mayor. And we've come together with the 12 biggest cities outside of London to, to um, start something called Free CI, which is a climate investment commission, which is essentially about trying to get the kind of trillions that are talked about at COP into real projects and communities. Because we've calculated for London and those 12 cities, there's a 206 billion gap to uh, to reach net zero so there's there's two you know the, the the need is too much for the public sector to to um to be able to de deliver alone so we're looking at, at new models to bring investment into our communities um, but I think finally and, and most importantly it's our role working alongside communities and in Camden we were the first council to run a citizens assembly and that had a really mixed uh, 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 range of people in there but together they were bolder than we would have ever been alone and we are implementing the plan that they set for us and and when people are facing you know, a, a massive cost of living crisis, struggling to heat their homes. Sometimes this this feels like the less urgent crisis. So we have to recognise that, you know, tackling this is a social justice issue and we need to focus our policies on um, those who need them the most. So when we, t when we retrofit homes, we actually take people out of, of, of fuel poverty and, and change lives and, and, that, and we have to always balance those two things together. Oh, that's amazing. I mean, engaging... Um community and public in those uh, decision-making um, processes and also part of that community is, is crucial. Um, but I'm going to move on. Um, I'm very keen uh, on listening to you and hearing about all the fantastic successful stories <laughs> that you have, the policies, the environmental policies and programs that you've implemented in London uh, that could serve as a model for other cities around the world? Yeah. Um, well, just, just as a precursor, you know, I'm saying, you know, we have slightly different powers to say New York City who have huge powers over their buildings. They're able to do a lot on building retrofit and, and removing gas boilers, for example. We don't have those powers. So what we do is focus in London on the things that the mayor, mayor is able to control, so largely transport and planning but then also a lot of work working local authorities and others convening people to do things. So, so three examples. The first one, you you know, if you're in London, probably outside of London, you've probably heard of the ultra low emission zone, uh, which we expanded last uh, August. And, and the reason I'm talking about that here is because um, the, 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 the causes of air pollution are very similar to the causes of uh, climate change and the solutions are very similar as well. And the ultra low emission zone has had a huge impact on reducing air pollution. We've had results for, for, for inner London, reduced it by half, um, you know, taking off uh, about 50,000 vehicles off the road already, so contributing to, to reducing carbon um, and, and, you know, really driving uh, people to, to think about their, their behaviour and use public transport more or use their cars less. You know, there is a place for a car, but, you know, what we need, especially in a congested city like London, um, is, is less of that. And, and I'm on a commission, our Common Air, which is really looking to elevate um, the impact of air pollution. Seven million uh, people around the world die from air pollution. It's one of the biggest risks, health risk factors, and yet it doesn't have the attention mm. that the climate has. Um, yeah, and, and it's shocking that it does. And you've probably heard the, the story of um, Ella Adu, Kissy Deborah, uh, you know, a, a nine year old girl who died. She was the first person to have air pollution cited as her cause of death. And that's really driven. Um, Sadiq's work in London, really pushing that. And what we do then is integrate, as people have talked about, climate into all aspects that we're doing. So, so that's a big um, policy bit that we've done on air pollution. And we're cleaning up our air five times faster than the national government is uh, across the country because of those policies. The second area is development. So we have new development going up in, in, in London and we have what we call uh, the London Plan, which sort of governs the spatial development 
of, of the city and we set standards. So we have set standards that are driving reductions in carbon emissions 50% beyond national building regulations. And by some quirk, we were able to set that policy even though government abandoned it for the rest of the country. So in London, we're really driving that. We're seeing developments coming across uh, the city which are really then not contributing to, to, to making the problem worse. And we, we are advocating, there's a consultation going on at the moment where government is talking about changing those standards um, and, um, and we're arguing that the local authorities should be able to set those standards um, above the, the ones the government set. Otherwise, we will then never get to that 2030 target. Um, so it's a huge difference, and that, that really does look at a whole range of issues, the London Plan, if you take a look at it. It's not just about reducing carbon, it's about how do you integrate nature into our, into our buildings, um, how do we protect the green belt, how do we um, look at air quality, how do we use the circular economy and promote that as well. And then the third piece I just talk about is is, uh, is greening our infrastructure in London. So um, again, you know that the, the climate emergency goes hand in hand with tackling the nature emergency and, and also um, uh, looking at social justice and one of the big issues for, for Sadiq is how do we make sure that people have access to nature? We saw that during the pandemic where, you know, probably about half of Londoners who didn't have access to a private balcony or a garden were really just start wandering the streets. And, you know, and I think people really appreciated that, that nature. So what we're trying to do is make sure that nature is on uh, more, more accessible, uh, more on people's doorsteps, but also trying to protect the species that we have and reintroducing species. So you've probably have heard about some of the, the beaver rewilding reintroduction projects we have in, in London, which are phenomenal. And, and, and what has been so special about those is, is the communities that bring that together. It's a combination of local authorities, NGOs, local communities who are absolutely desperately protective of these, these species and want to make sure that they thrive. And it just inspires people and it's very emotional when, when, you, when you use it, if you ever get the chance to, to be at one of those, because you can see how passionate people are. And that connection to nature really then drives, I think, other people's action on, on climate and other things. So those are just a few things. Do have a look at our website. We're coming up, you know, to, we'll be publishing some reports recently uh, in a few uh, weeks' time about some of our achievements as well, but there's lots out there. Um, and we're always, I should say, that we're always happy to learn from other cities. You know, London has, hasn't got the monopoly on, on good practice. And through C40 cities, we've learned from other cities around the world and they learn from us. And that's really a way to drive action across, across uh, cities globally. Collaboration in uh, its true nature. That's amazing. And thank you so much for also addressing the air pollution issue. The new report um, is suggesting nearly 11 million premature deaths globally per year due to air pollution from the burning of fossil fuels. And as you said, um, um, it's very important to Absolutely. focus on that because I don't think um, we are aware of the huge impact it has on um, our health. Um, and um, I'm not going to uh, go into the details, but uh, infertility, still yeah. does, and all those issues. So thank you so much for also um, mentioning that um, in uh, answering your question. I'm going to now look at a uh, tone um, that balance that we need uh, with all the uh, recent crises. The economic growth is also uh, an important issue that needs to be uh, looked at. How do you think governments can effectively balance economic growth and environmental sustainability in their policy-making agendas, um, particularly in the post-pandemic recovery phase? I feel like we are still mm. in that phase, aren't we? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And I think this is a really, really important point. It kind of comes back to what I was saying earlier about the fact that, you know, climate action is super important, but it exists in a number of other important goals for any government. And providing economic growth is absolutely key to kind of maintain, you know, prosperity, kind of living standards for, for people. And um, I think what's very interesting that's been happening is that we've kind of gone from a period where climate was seen as something that would be a negative impact on growth, which has been seen globally as something that will kind of um, spur growth. And I think what's really interesting is that, you know, you got about, I think um, Bloomberg recently uh, announced that there had been like well over a trillion invested in uh, clean technologies um, last year. And I think, I think that speaks of the kind of movement of money into that and the, the fact that kind of clean technologies is being seen as a kind of um, a, a way to growth and prosperity. And if you look at, you know, the Inflation Reduction Act in the United States, 
they've gone uh, ahead and you know have a very ambitious spending program which is leading to huge job growth new businesses new opportunities for people across the country in a number of communities um, and similar action is being taken in countries across the globe at the moment um, and I think um, what's really important there in particular as well is the in incredibly um, the incredible power of um, clean technology because what, what, we're, what we're essentially doing is that we, we are innovating to make clean technologies the cheaper, better option that is, is a better option that will fuel economic growth and fuel, um, fuel uh, cost reductions to make it the, the better alternative for um, how we power, how we, how we deal with our kind of, um, how we drive economic growth for our societies. And I think um, policymakers have been incredibly key in achieving that. Um, if you think about the UK, you know, um, the contracts for difference scheme is basically what's led to the rapid fall in uh, the cost of offshore wind. Um, incentivizing those type of uh, behaviors and that, that kind of um, innovation, is, it means that climate is now kind of interlinked with um, economic growth and prosperity. Um, and I think the most important thing policymakers can do now to kind of keep linking those is, is thinking about how you create those right incentives to continue that kind of trend and continue the kind of trend of, um, you know, it's not more profitable or better to focus on fossil fuels. It's better to focus on green policies. And I think um, we're definitely moving there as a society, but we can, we can certainly do more, in particular in the UK, I think. Thank you. Uh, we did talk about um, increasing ambitions earlier and those ambitious targets. Uh, Robbie, I'm now going to um, touch on the social justice issue, a very important um, issue uh, that needs to be addressed. So how do you navigate the political landscape to ensure that climate policies are not only ambitious, we all need that, but also socially just and equitable? Yeah, exactly. Um, I think that, you know, they, we need climate ambition um, and we also need policies um, which can help alleviate the cost of living. I think 1.5 degrees um, over the past year, we have, um, you know, some record temperature break, um, record temperature um, increases um, and records been broken again. Um, year on year on year, we're seeing this trend. Meanwhile, what we're seeing is a cost of living crisis, which is um, absolutely battering households. Um, across the country and so I think that on the, on the positive side the good news is is that um, climate policies can be both ambitious towards decarbonisation and they can also help to um, you know bring us to a society um, that is not so impacted um, by um, the cost of living um, and in terms of the political landscape um, we mentioned talked about earlier sort of the consensus and um, the sort of increased disagreements that are happening um, between politicians um, in this in this area and i think that you know on the one hand um in september last year the prime minister stood outside downing street and said that he wants um, a more pragmatic i think um proportionate and realistic um approach to net zero and climate policy um well i would just say um on that that in 2013 i think quote the, the green crop was ditched and we saw now um and in the previous few years um, amidst the energy crisis what that impact had um, on households. So I think that that's a really good example of how, you know, we need to be more, uh, more ambitious. Pragmatic, yes, to ensure that things can be delivered, but we can't lose that ambition because that also hurts households um, in the long run. And just another example, um, actually, um, of a policy, which I would like to talk about, if that's all right, um, of, um, that's going through Parliament right now is the Offshore Petroleum Licensing Bill. Um, you might have heard of it as the sort of oil and gas bill, the bill that basically is um, set to mandate an annual licensing round um, of oil and gas um, developments in the North Sea. Um, and the metric I think that the government said they would like to measure that by um, is its ability to um, protect jobs, um, enhance energy security, um, and drive forward climate action. Um, and unfortunately, that fails on all three metrics. Um, so in the past 10 years, um, which is not actually that funny, um, you know, the oil and gas um, industry have lost 200,000 jobs, or just over, um, despite hundreds of new um, drilling licenses. Um, and so it's hard to see how, you know, endless exploration and developments of new oil and gas then leads to any kind of just transition which these workers um, 
desperately, quite frankly, need. You know, today there are 30,000 oil and gas workers um, in, in the um, oil and gas um, sector, a further 100,000 or just over supported by um, supply chain um, employment. And this particular legislation offers them nothing. Um, on the energy security side, I would just say that North Sea oil, 80% of that is um, sent overseas and sold on the international market to the highest bidder. So it's not really doing anything um, for us in the UK. Um, what's majority, um, and that's what's majority left um, in the North Sea in the first place. Um, and then in terms of gas, um, estimates show that new licensing between now and 2050 would only provide 103 days um, of gas or four days of gas a year um, for the UK. So again, failing on energy security. And in terms of climate, well, well I mean, I don't really need to tell this audience, but um, fossil fuels aren't going to take us um, towards our climate goals or help to build the future um, that we need. Um, the UN Secretary General says that, the IEA says that, the IPC says that, um, the former energy minister who stood down from Parliament in protest over this bill also says that, um, and so do so many other people. Um, so I think that, you know, on the one hand, um, this pragmatic approach to net zero um, is damaging people, um, and this particular legislation um, definitely is. Um, and I think that you touched on the um, Inflation Reduction Act. Though not perfect in its entirety, is a great example um, of how climate policies um, and um, social justice can occur and run parallel um, to each other. Um, and, yeah, I would just also finish by saying that if they're not, you know, considered through a social justice lens um, and a and the climate ambition lens, um, and I think that we just get what happened in France, um, well, just recently, they do it quite well, the French, don't they, in terms of protest, but, um, you know, the gilets jaunes and um, the farmers um, up in arms, we can't afford that if we want uh, policies to have longevity, and so people need to be considered, and, you know, climate assemblies are a really important tool um, to ensuring that people's voices um, can be heard um, in the policy um, debate, but, I would just probably finish by yeah, saying that. Thank you, and uh, thank you for saying that um, people's voices need to be heard. And with that, I'm going to also um, just mention here that the voices of youth in climate change movement is also crucial. And Annabelle, with that, I'm going to ask you, how do you think international climate diplomacy should involve and represent the voices of young people? Um, and we would love to, of course, uh, hear about your work with the G7 uh, Youth Engagement Group. Uh, later on, we are going to have an activism panel as well with our a wonderful uh, young activist. So, we're very much keen to hear from you. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you for asking this question. I think it's so important to bring youth into a policy-making discussion. Um, just in terms of, of my background, it was two years ago now, I was selected as the youth delegate for climate to attend the youth engagement group for the G7, um, which was an incredible experience, and I would absolutely encourage everyone to apply for it if you're under the age of 30, which I'm clinging on to um, <laughs> for dear life. Um, so, yeah, it was an incredible experience, and I've also a attended COPs in the past, and so have a few reflections on kind of what makes the difference between meaningful youth engagement and what otherwise might be seen as, as somewhat tokenism. Um, I think the really crucial thing for me was that it, beyond just being provided the opportunity for young people to attend events, so it's amazing to speak at events, to attend COPs, to go to the G7, those are all really, really amazing opportunities. But what I found was really lacking was access to decision-making spaces. I think that was particularly true at COP. And again, I probably don't need to tell many in this room that by the time we get to a COP conference, there's been several conferences in the run-up. So there's subsidiary body conferences and a, a whole series of, of, of other events. And there's actually, it's much more difficult for young people to get invited to those kind of conferences and to participate there. And yet, those are where all the decisions are actually made. By the time we get to COP, yes, of course, there's a few really pivotal moments in there, really, really important for international diplomacy. But a lot of the basis for the decisions has already been made. And so if young people aren't included in the spaces where actual policy is being considered, I think, I think that that is, is a huge issue. Um, and just and going back to citizens' assemblies as well, which has already been mentioned, I think young people and people in general, when they attend citizens' panels, they consistently come up with more progressive policies, which just shows that there's such an appetite, uh, appetite for action. Um, 
I think the other thing to consider with young people is the kinds of people who are able to attend and be represented at these events. I think, and that can just range from really basic logistics, like young people have school, or they might have university, or they may have other jobs as well. It's a huge time commitment to also try and be a policymaker in your spare time and often have no access to training. I mean, that's not something that's unique to young people, and um, I'm a member of the Future Leaders Network. And it was it's a, new, a study came out, I think it was last year, that 82% of people in management or leadership positions have never, ever had management or leadership training. Um, which, I mean, some people might not find shocking in terms of, like, maybe you've had managers where that's definitely the case. But I think it's something that we really need to change and that young people can't be expected to just go into these positions having no training, limited access, limited capacity, and be able to, to change the world. Um, and the last thing I'll say is that I, there's a tendency, I think, to think of young people as this like really inspirational people who, whilst it may definitely be true, and I, I hope that it is true, it's not the only thing that they are, and it's not the only thing they could, should be considered to be. So we often have at COPS a young person will come to the stage and give an amazing, rousing speech, and then they won't be allowed into the decision-making room. So kind of what, what was the point? that young people aren't there to sort of give you a boost so that you can then make great policy. They're there because they have amazing contributions and they have a different perspective on the world that needs to be represented in our policies, in particular our climate policies, given that they'll be the ones inheriting a lot of the problems um, that, we're, that we're facing and that we're causing. Uh, so yeah, those are the key takeaways for me. That's wonderful, thank you. So rapid climate action, ambitious goals and uh, policies. Uh, and that brings me to you with that, um, having that balance that is needed, um, Georgia. How do you balance the need for rapid climate action with the demands of local governance and community engagement? Sorry, it's a bit of a... <laughs> I think we've talked a bit about the power of citizens' assemblies, and I think the reason we, we did a, a climate citizens' assembly was because we're aware that this can be a, a space that's really contested, and in our assembly we have people who feel like Camden Council persecutes car users, and then people who think we should ban all cars and every range of opinion in between. And we actually did a lot of work with schools before that, and they presented in to the assembly. And I think it's really important that people have a space to have that, that real dialogue across difference. Um, that in an assembly, people are paid for their time. And so it is, you kind of honor that time and it means you, you have a much more diverse group of people than, than you would otherwise. And then they publicly came to a, a consensus, which actually was more ambitious than I think we probably would have been on our own um, and um, because the evidence was presented to them uh, and the way that decision is made I think is really important so there's a, a kind of legitimacy to our climate action plan because it has been written by citizens and they also set up a, a climate panel that holds us to account as a council on delivering uh, against those ambitions um, so and then I think it's 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 just critical that in every way you kind of lead this work that you do it alongside people and and consider um, and consider what the gains are. So one really good example is uh, just around the corner from here, we, there, was a, there was a kind of road that was not used well, um, just a bit of parking, kind of antisocial behaviour, and that has now been turned into a, a park, Alfred Place, if anyone wants to go and have a bit of lunch there. And seeing, um, you know, kids find that park, the community find it, the kind of joy that that brings, um, it's a real gain from uh, the change we're making, but it also helps climate resilience, um, tree planting, and so on. So what, how do we ensure that things actually change for people and that they are part of the action themselves? And we've set up a number of kind of climate spaces where, uh, where we're supporting community action. And we have young people who want to run clothes swaps or um, people who want to run tree planting programmes or set up food co-ops or things that are practical uh, to lead change in, in their community. And I think supporting and getting behind that is, is, is so important because often... Um, Often the, the energy and ideas is there. It just needs backing by uh, by councils and, and by government. Um, but I don't. I think we can't hide from the fact that that some of this is is really hard and really contested. And there is a lot of money going into campaigns to um, get you know against uh, low low traffic neighbourhoods or um, ULEs or 
15 minute cities and it doesn't help when you have the government kind of trying to turn this into a, a culture war issue and so I think it's it's really important that there is that that, that we take the time to to bring people with us to go deep into communities to to work along uh, alongside uh, people so that, that this we don't let this become a culture a culture war issue uh, and we and we and we hold the community together because most people really want to take action um, but they they just need the kind of forums and support wonderful um Shirley um how do you envision leveraging your role as a deputy mayor of London to just further accelerate the city's transition to a greener and more sustainable future? Yeah, um, I mean, obviously I was appointed by Sadiq as, a, as his deputy mayor, but, you know, my, my role really is just to, to work with people in London. So obviously the boroughs who are, are you know, the 33 boroughs who are, who are the deliverers, you know, they're, they're closest on the ground. So the sorts of things that we, we can do in London are really um, do the sort of convening we talked about, pilot things, set up the London-wide policy that, um, you know, in consultation with boroughs and others to take that forward. Um, so that, that's one way. But I guess um, it's really using the role to advocate um, what London is doing, you know, and, and when, when I say London, I don't just mean by the Mayor of London, but, you know, our businesses, our communities, our local authorities, and really sort of set it out there as, um, you know, what could be done in the city. So one of the, the projects we're working with um, uh, is uh, Future Neighbourhoods 2030. So actually we've got two, one in Somerstown in, in Camden with uh, working with, with Georgia and also one in Nottingdale in, in Kensington, mm -hmm. Chelsea, where really, we're, you know, our role is really to, to say, um, you know, what do the communities want? and that get them to, you know, and it was very much, you, you bid and tell us what you want, but it's you bidding, not the local authority. It's got to come from the community, but obviously you have to work with the local authority because they're going to have to implement many of things. And we've got these two amazing projects, very different, very different in scope, but it is very much to the, the conversation we've just been having about, uh, you have to engage people and use um, their inspiration and their ambition to really drive and talk to their peers about this climate action thing is actually a health thing. You know, by by Absolutely. by um, looking at reducing car use and promoting walking and cycling, it's about cleaning up the air um, um, as well as climate change. But you know, reducing that that impact on our lungs and, and and premature deaths and so on. It helps bring green jobs in. And what are green jobs? They're just jobs that are in these new industries, um, but they're better, high quality, better paid. So making it real. And I think those are the sorts of things mm. we you know that that my role is is really about. And then internationally, um, it's about. Um, um, that race to the top, you know, so that competition. So when Sadiq is in a meeting with C40 mayors, you know, from Milan to Paris to New York to Freetown, you know, they all talk about what they're doing and then they go back and say, why aren't we doing that? You know, why can't we do that better? Um, so it's, it's about um, making our city the best it can be, really understanding that internet connection between climate, social justice, the nature of emergency, air pollution, you know, all of those things are absolutely integrated. But in the end, it's about... Um, the quality of people's lives and and that's really my role is to advocate for that so in any avenue that we can so that's why i'm here for example <laughs> what an amazing conversation um thank you all so much uh, councillor georgia gall deputy mayor shirley rodriguez uh, robbie mcpherson um political senior political advisor annabel rice political advisor and ton senior policy advisor thank you all so much for joining us